One thing I love about kids is how confident they are, how um, free of fears oftentimes, or they don't care about what people think about them. And so you see this confidence in kids. And um, what really stands out to me is my third child. Uh, it's always the third, right? That's more confident, uh, outgoing, a little bit crazy. And so um, when he was younger, I remember one time we went to a auto shop to have our Suburban worked on. And when we were there, there was this Italian guy that ran the shop. And he's like, hey, we had Tony with us. He's like, hey, what's your name? And of course, his name is Tony. So he's like, my name is Tony. <laughs> and the guy just started cracking up. He's like, oh, Tony, that's awesome, you know. But it's the same third child that would climb up on anything from stairs to tabletops and leap if you were walking by. And without any sort of catch me or anything, he just had this trust that if he liked you, you would for sure catch him. And so some of you have been around for years, maybe you remember those days, leaping Tony and saving him from the floor. But childlike confidence. Remember those days in your life when you had that childlike confidence? But something happens in our life and a number of things. But one of the things I've noticed is that we, during that time, believed that we were invincible. But then one day, reality hits and we realize we're not. And a lot of things change in that moment when we realize that we're mortal. It causes a certain level of fear or anxiety, changes the way we approach life. But after truly believing in applying the truth of the gospel, we can once again experience that childlike confidence about life so that we could leap, you know, into the arms of God, our heavenly father, and know that he's going to catch us. And so I like this word that we find today in this passage, good courage, which means to have hopeful confidence, boldness, or courage in the face of danger or testing. It's the same root word that we find in John 16, 33, where Jesus says this to his disciples. I've said these things to you that you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation, but take heart. There's the phrase, take heart. I have overcome the world. So be of good courage today. Last week, we talked about discouragement and what God has provided for us to come out of that discouragement. But today we talk about what it means to be of good courage now, in 1 Corinthians, I've noticed, and maybe you did too, that Paul talked a lot about sex, and it was kind of uncomfortable at times, preaching through that book. And sometimes I had people asking, you know, when are we going to stop talking about the S word? <laughs> but 2 Corinthians is equally uncomfortable in that we talk a lot about death. Paul talks a lot about death. Have you noticed? Suffering and death, and it, which also makes us uncomfortable. But these uncomfortable topics are often essential issues that we need to face in our own life. If God can't answer these big questions for us, then he's not much of a God. And Christianity wouldn't be offering us much hope. But what we find is that God not only wrote the instruction manual, but he has answers for you in your life with regard to your own mortality. And so this section continues with the thought that chapter four ended with, and I wanna begin by reading these verses. So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, 
but the things that are unseen are eternal. So today, be of good courage as we continue with this train of thought of what and how we should view our lives inside these broken vessels, these earthen vessels, our bodies. And so, uh, and I do want to point out, Monty's here today. And a lot of you guys have been praying for Monty. He's been going through cancer treatment. Let's give him a hand. <laughs> Praise the Lord. It's good to see you face to face. <laughs> God's good. Well, in verses one through C, we see our first point. Be of good courage because God creates for you a heavenly body. In verse one, for we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Interesting that Paul chose a tent as an example because he was a tent maker. If there's anybody under, that understood the limitations of living in tents, it was Paul because he made them and probably repaired them and everything else. And so he understood how this body of ours is temporary. It has limitations, just like a tent. They're not as comfortable as your house. And not only that, but um, this tent is temporary. And so God has something better and more permanent. Paul calls it a building, um, which is way more comfortable than camping in a tent. There's four characteristics about this building. Number one, it's from God. It's from God, which that future body that we will be living in that will last forever is from God. It's a gracious gift after we've destroyed the first one. <laughs> You know, it's, it's kind of like our heavenly father, after we crash a car, he gives us a brand new one that is way better. Well, it's also not made with hands. Only a body that God could create. It's not made from the genes of your ancestors. Think about that. Brand new, clean slate, straight from God perfect from the beginning and always will be. And this body also will be eternal, immortal, but also fourthly in the heavens. It's completely out of this world. It has a heavenly nature. And I like to think of, you know, right now, we cannot experience the full force of the glory of God. I mean, think about um, we are geared to see the physical or, or the uh, visible spectrum of light, but what about all the other spectrums of X-rays and gamma rays and all these different things? You know, it would destroy us if we were exposed to it, but this heavenly body will be able to be in the glory of God and not be destroyed. And so in 1 Corinthians 15, 42, Paul talks about this heavenly body. It says, so it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. What is sown in dishonor is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus, it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man from heaven. As was the man of dust, so are also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. 
Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear, and this is the body we're talking about now, we'll bear the image of the man of heaven. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trump will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. For this perishable body, perishable body must put on the imperishable and this mortal body must put on immortality. And so we will receive this heavenly body which Paul also calls a spiritual body, but don't misunderstand. He's not talking about us being disembodied spirits. This is a true body. We often see the spiritual world as like a mist, you know? Um, maybe we've seen movies where they give you a picture of a ghost passing through and they, you know, they just look like a mist going through stuff. But let me propose reality is different. We, in this physical form, are like the mist. But our spiritual reality, that spiritual body we will have, is like the solid stuff uh, that the mist passes through. And oftentimes, all we can see is the mist. But the reality in that spiritual reality, that body that we will have one day, man, that is the stuff that the mist just passes around. It can't impact it. It can't move it. And so we will receive these spiritual bodies one of two ways. Either we are resurrected or we are raptured. So those who have died, will be raised from the dead and given that new body. And those who are alive when Christ comes back will be raptured or caught up with him in the air and we will be changed in a twinkling of an eye. So I look forward to that. I don't know about you guys, that new model <laughs> that's coming out. Well, in verse two, for in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. Groan. We groan right now in this body that we're in. I groan more than I used to groan. To groan means to vocally indicate pain, discomfort, or displeasure, often without words. I want to do something. On the count of three, I want you all to groan the way you did when you woke up this morning. One, two, three. Ugh. That was sorry, but it'll work. Groanings are not meant to be pretty, right? But we groan when we suffer all sorts of things like weakness and sickness and pain and sadness, getting older, the effects of the curse, relational problems, unfulfilled desires, unmet needs, but also persecution and trials tribulations. They cause us to groan. I used to love to camp in tents, but the older I've got, which I was in my 30s when I quit doing it, you know, so that wasn't real old, but it was old enough to hate the feeling of waking up um, just with your body hurting because of how hard that ground is, you know? It makes you groan. But here's the thing about this word groan. Although it is the noise we make when we're uncomfortable, there is a more important aspect to it, and that is the aspect of longing. The groan is a longing to be back in your own bed. You know, it's a longing to be not in this body, but in that eternal body. It's a longing for you to finally be who God is making you into after you accepted Christ. And so it's the same word in Romans 8 
verse 23, it says, and not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit grown inwardly as we wait. And here's the longing. We wait eagerly for adoptions as sons, the redemption of our bodies. And so next time you groan, let it be a reminder of your longing, not your current suffering, which we can get into that discouraged, downcast mood, you know, but God wants us to long when we groan, to look forward, to have hope. In our hearts, we know we were made for eternity. In Ecclesiastes 3.11, it says he has made everything beautiful in its time. And one day that will happen. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart. Yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. Eternity has been put in our hearts. And, and so it doesn't feel right when we physically begin to break down. When we start falling apart. It doesn't feel right when people die. We know something's messed up. It's not the way it was supposed to be. And I like what this theologian Baptist says. All people take for granted that humans are by nature immortal and that it is death, not immortality, that requires explanation. It is death that seems an unnatural thing. And it's so true because that is the way God created us. And so we groan because we long and we know this is not the way it's supposed to be. In verse three, it goes on, if indeed by putting it on, we may not be found naked. And so now Paul switches from a tent and building analogy to a clothing analogy that we put on a new set of clothing. Right now, we have an old set of clothing. Um, we are, in a sense, right now, naked. And that we experience the shame in our mortal bodies, just as Adam and Eve, when they realized they were sinners, they, were, they felt shame. In 1 Corinthians 15, 37, it says, and what you sow is not the body that is to be, but the bare kernel, the bare kernel. That this body now is like a bare kernel. It's like a naked kernel. Um, perhaps of wheat of some other grain is what Paul says, but um, one day we will be fully clothed. When we put on our eternal selves, we'll be glorified and not ashamed, not ashamed because this body is tainted by the fall which resulted in shame and nakedness, but we will be clothed and glorified. The process of being transformed by the Holy Spirit on the inside will also be completed. So not only will we be given a perfect body, but we will be transformed into that perfect image of Christ. So we're going to be changed on the outside, but also the inside all at the same time. And so we see the fulfillment of 2 Corinthians 3.18. And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed. Right now we're being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. But on that day, we will be fully transformed. We will experience a total makeover, not only on the out inner man, but on the outer man. And somehow, just like when Christ was raised from the dead, somehow we'll still be identifiable as ourselves. But we'll be the way God has always intended for us to be. So you will still be you, but you will be the you God meant for you to be. Well, in verse four, we see our second reason for good courage. It says, be of good courage because you will be overcome by life. Um, so in verse four, for while we are still in this tent, we groan being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed so that what is mortal 
may be swallowed up by life. In this body, we are burdened, which means to be weighed down with a heavy load in such a way that you suffer. It's laborious. Um, life can feel laborious. When I was going through my uh, bone marrow transplant cancer treatment, uh, just taking a shower was laborious. Um, I haven't started enjoying showers still yet because it's laborious. Um, and it reminds me of those days where I almost passed out standing in the shower, you know, which would be a horrible place to pass. Um, but there is a laborious nature of life. Whether you have cancer or not, you notice your body drags you down. Paul experienced this burden in 2 Corinthians 1.8. He says, For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened. There's that same word. They were so burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. And so that his burden at that time was the circumstances of suffering. So whether it be your health or your circumstances, this body is often burdened and there is a reason why. Because it's broken. <laughs> you know, it, it is meant to be transformed. And so we will one day, as it says here, be further clothed. Praise the Lord. You know, the Greeks believed, and I think further clothed is an important phrase because the Greeks believed that a person's soul was actually trapped in their physical bodies and that they needed to die for that soul to be free. Spending eternity is a disembodied spirit, but Paul makes it very clear that God didn't create us to be disembodied spirits. We were made to live an embodied existence. And therefore, we will be clothed with this heavenly body so that what is mortal, this that we have on right now, will be swallowed up by life. Think about that phrase, swallowed up by the normal idea is death. Swallowed up by death. You know, death is envisioned as swallowing up the living. Um, and it has been for centuries and millennia. To be swallowed up is to be completely consumed. It's a picture of an animal devouring its prey. The Canaanites actually had a god named Mot, the god of death, who would swallow his victims. So both gods and humans feared this god Mot in their, their theology as inescapable as a uh, fearful monster that had an insatiable appetite. That's why it says in Isaiah 5.14, therefore Sheol, um, the place of the dead, has enlarged its appetite and opened its mouth beyond measure. So that picture of death swallowing up the living was common. And when Paul says this, it's shocking because the picture for a believer is not that. The picture for you, if you have put your faith in Christ, is that you will be swallowed up by life. What an amazing statement that mortality is swallowed up by life. Maybe you need to change the way you see death for the believer. Christ conquered not only sin on the cross, but he conquered death when he rose from the grave so that none of us would have to die, but rather we would be raised. And God has turned the tables so that now death is swallowed up. Check this out. 1 Corinthians 15, 54, when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Amen? Where, O oh, death, is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? It's gone for the believer. And so this should be a tremendous comfort for you as maybe you lost that confidence when you realized you were not immortal. 
But here we see that there is a certain aspect of immortality for you when you put your faith in Christ, that you have before you life, always. There is not a dark tunnel of death. There's life in a fuller sense than you could ever imagine. And it only gets better from here. And that's good news. Be of good courage. The third thing, be of good courage because God gives you a foretaste of your heavenly inheritance. In verse five, who has prepared us for this very thing is God. So it's again, a reminder here that all this is a gift from God. It's not achievable by any one of us. It's from God. But notice this, who has given us the spirit as a guarantee? The spirit as a guarantee. This word guarantee um, means a deposit or partial payment made at the time when something's purchased with the balance to be paid later. So you put some of the money down and then later you'll put all the money down. The Spirit of God indwells each and every believer. When you put your faith in Christ, the Spirit indwells you. You become the temple of God. And we have this, as we've talked about, treasure and jars of clay. This personal, immediate relationship with God through the Spirit. This relationship through the Spirit is God's first installment paid as a pledge to confirm that final transaction. The spirit is in you now. You have a piece of what is to come. Another way to think of this is that it is a foretaste. The spirit is a foretaste. And so this is not only a verbal pledge when we talk about a guarantee. It's not a just, I promise this will happen. What you have right now, what you experience right now is actually part of the thing being purchased. Isn't that cool how God does that? He's in you right now. In Philippians 1, 6, and funny, Grant read this uh, during worship, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. That final purchase will be made and he will give you all the rest of your inheritance. But what we have today is a sample of exactly what is to come. Um, I like what Dane Ortland says about this, the spirit being the guarantee. He says, the spirit is the beginning experience here and now of the life of the age to come. The superlative joy of the new earth, its warm, intimate, restored fellowship with God in the spirit, that fellowship has already begun. And sometimes we forget that treasure we have right now in a intimate relationship with God through the Holy Spirit that he is continually illuminating the scriptures and being our teacher, that He is our comforter. He is our helper. That one of his big jobs is to reveal Jesus Christ. And so as the spirit is in us, we clearly are able to see and experience Christ. Um, And therefore, the father. Are you partaking of this guarantee right now? Do you value that relationship with the Lord that it is a piece of heaven right here, right now? And it only expands beyond your imagination. If you've ever wished that a spiritual retreat or conference or quiet time, devotion time could last longer through the day or an amazing time of worship, like, man, I just wish we could not stop. Heaven will be like that. We won't ever have to stop. But right now, we get a taste. Well, the last thing, to be of good courage. 
Be of good courage because you are just a heartbeat from home. In verse six, so we are always of good courage. And again, I, I wanna point out that this is the flip side of what he was saying earlier in verse one of chapter four and verse 16 of chapter four, where he said, don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. But now he's saying, be of good courage. If your heart and your attitude is not impacted by what you believe, then you miss out on this. If you truly believe what the gospel teaches and you embrace it and experience it in your heart, you will also live it as a reality today and you can be of good courage. But it's all based on the truth. Our good courage flows from the, three theological truths found in God's word here specifically. Number one, our future resurrection or rapture. Number two, the gift of the spirit. But the third thing we see is in this point. To be away from the body is to be at home with the Lord. And so he continues on and he says, we know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Our heavenly father's plan for us to, when we die for the believer, we go immediately into the presence of Jesus Christ. Now we know that our current state is like this. Our current state is that we're in ho at home in our earthly body. We're away from the Lord. This earthly body is like an earthen vessel. It's weak. It can easily crack and break. It's made of the stuff of earth. Stuff of earth. It's part of the old creation but our future state we've been talking about, it's a heavenly body where we're at home with the Lord, we'll be glorified and it's made of the stuff of heaven. So it will be eternal. It's part of the new creation. But what happens to a believer between the time that they're in this body and the resurrection if they die? That is what theologians call the intermediate state. What happens during that intermediate time? Well, neither the earthly body or the heavenly body is what we're talking about during the intermediate state. But what we do know about it, though we don't know a lot, and there's a lot of different kinds of theories in theological ideas about the intermediate state, nobody's completely sure except for this. We are at home with the Lord. So however else God fills in the blanks of the unknowns, that's up to him. But we can be sure of this very truth that those who die immediately go to the presence of the Lord. And there is no, there's no travel time. <laughs> you know, it took us 35 minutes to get to church today. You know, a little travel time to get here. And when believers die, there is no travel time. You are immediately with the Lord. There's no soul sleep. There's no purgatory, you know, the rest stop of punishment or whatever you want to call it. You go immediately into the Lord's presence. Jesus tells the thief on the cross this, as he was dying next to Jesus, he, and he puts his faith in Christ, Jesus said to him, truly, I say to you, today, you'll be with me in paradise. So the current state, the intermediate state, and the final state, or the future state, each state is superior to the one before. But here's the thing I like about the fact that there is an intermediate state is that our heavenly father planned for all of us to experience the gift of our heavenly bodies together at the same time. You know, it's like a, a 
dad that is waiting for the kids to come down for Christmas and, you know, little Johnny slept in and the other kids are ready to open the presents right now. And the father says, you know what? We got to wait. We got to wait for Johnny. Oh, man. Come on, Johnny. Get down here. And there's that heart of the heavenly father that says, no, all you guys at the same time, And so that's what it's going to be like when we receive that new glorified heavenly body in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of a trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together. Notice that. Together. With them in the clouds to meet who? The Lord in the air, so that we will always be with the Lord. How cool is that? So we look forward to the day when all of our brothers and sisters in Christ and all those you have loved that have gone before us to be with the Lord, that we will be reunited and experience this inheritance at the same time. But for now, Paul says here, we walk by faith, not by sight. Sometimes people use that phrase, we walk by faith, not by sight, as like saying, oh, well, I don't know why, but I'll trust God anyway. Uh, We walk by faith, not by sight. But that's not what it means here. This is a statement of certainty in the things that are unseen. We walk by faith confidently, boldly, with courage right now because we know of the reality of the things that are unseen. And so in Hebrews 1 or 11.1, it says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. One of the coolest examples of this is in the Old Testament, I think, when Elijah, the Assyrian army went to find Elijah the prophet to kill him because he kept telling Israel the Assyrian army's plan to um, attack Israel. And they kept counterattacking and so on. So here comes this army and it surrounds Elijah's house and his servants there with him and his servant is scared. But Elijah, for some reason, is confident. He's of good courage. And notice this in 2 Kings 6.16. He said, do not be afraid. For those who are with us are more than those who are with them. I would imagine that servant's like, what are you talking about? You know, are you losing your mind? What's going on? Well, then Elijah prayed and said, oh Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elijah. That's why Elijah was confident and bold. Even though an enemy army surrounded him, God's army surrounded the enemy. There are things that we know are true because God tells us in his word, And when we begin to walk by faith, not by sight, we have that boldness and confidence like Elijah. Elijah. So here, walking by faith and not by sight is focusing on the truth that we just talked about, that we are a heartbeat away from home. Some believers are consumed by what they can see. And so you get freaked out at your mortal body when it breaks or your health or we want to see our best life now. But just a little side note, those who have their best life now are those that are going to hell because this is the best they will ever have. This is not our best life yet. It's coming. So we should be consumed not by what we see with our eyes, but by what we know is true. By what we know is true, God's word. 
though we may not see it immediately. One day, God will open our eyes. <laughs> and that will be an immediate experience, just a heartbeat from home. It'll be much better to be with Jesus than being stuck in this mortal body on this earth. And Paul expresses kind of that torn desire between the two. In Philippians 1.21, he says this, for to me to live is Christ. If I live right now, it's all about Jesus. And to die, it's even better. It's gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, yet which shall I choose I cannot tell. I'm hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. And when God healed me from my cancer, that was a reality of thinking, okay, um, well, if I die, I'll be with Jesus, so that's good. How is that good? You know, and you kind of struggle with those thoughts sometimes, right? I'm a little bit scared, but I trust God. You know, I believe in the gospel. The gospel has given me hope. You know, where, where's the power? If we do not be of good courage, where is the power of the spirit and the power of the gospel in our life? And so, yeah, I had those glimmers of like, yeah, I'm ready. But then those inklings of, but what about my kids? You know, even more, what about my wife? <laughs> and also what about the church? You know, so when God healed me, I figured, well, okay, he's got me here for a reason. In that reality to know that you are here for a reason. You are here for a reason. It's not ours to force God's hand so that we end up in his presence, but rather to trust him for the now and why he has us here. It's for a good thing. And we're gonna get into that more next week. But I wanna conclude with this. Are you ready to gain that childlike confidence in your future? Not because of ignorance, but rather because of certainty, certainty of the truth that we believe. That is the power of the gospel. To break you from the fear of death itself. And to be able to live life abundantly in Christ. Well, let's pray. If you're here today and you know the truth of the gospel, but you haven't put your faith in Jesus for salvation, I want you to join me in this prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for my sin on the cross. That you paid the price for all my sin, past, present, and future, by shedding your blood on my account. I receive what you have done for me that you paid the price and I call on your name as my savior, Jesus, son of God. Save me, a lost sinner. Lord, now I pray your spirit would fill me and lead me in following you all of my days and on to eternity. And for all of us, Lord, I pray you would instill in us that good courage that comes from knowing the truth of the gospel. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. 